Limits of Orlando, Orange County has done likewise in conjunction with the ordinance. We established a task force of law enforcement officers, legal staff to better understand what's going on out there and to make rec recommendations on how we should move forward. And that task force is ready to report their findings and present next steps. Chief, you want to do the intros? I'd love to. Good morning, Mayor, City Commissioners. I believe we all know why prescription drug abuse and these pill mills are so important to our community. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, has reported that Florida, Florida leads the nation in prescription drug misuse. You're going to hear this over and over today, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but seven Floridians, seven Floridians die each day as a result of prescription drug overdoses. I can tell you that, that our officers respond to these and it's sad, from college students to folks in their mid-30s, 40s, uh, to the elderly. And it's extremely sad, over and over, how we find out how they've uh, abused prescription drugs. And it doesn't discriminate, as we all know. Prescription drug abuse crosses all age spans, from drug-addicted newborns to senior citizens. And I honestly believe that we all know someone who may be misusing prescription drugs. I know I do. The city of Orlando had, and I repeat had, 21 pain clinics <laughs> registered in the city of Orlando. Had 21 pain clinics. Uh, OPD, working very closely with MBI, Metropolitan Bureau of Investigation, and other state, FDLE, and federal agencies such as DEA, have worked very hard in conducting undercover operations at these pain clinics, and we've closed four to date. So we had 21, we've closed four of them. And I just want to highlight these two because I think they're very important. Two examples are Injury Mid-Florida and Pain Relief Orlando. Uh, there was a doctor, he no longer has his license, named uh, Jumani. Dr. Jumani operated two of these pill mills in the city, Pain Relief Orlando, 2121 South Orange Ave, and Pain Relief Center at 1704 Wolco Way. Both of these locations were illegally owned, illegally owned by Lewis, Darren, and, Sh and Jarrett Shapiro, who are non-physicians. Dr. Jumani, and this is incredible, was responsible for prescribing over 500,000, 500,000, a half a million oxycodone pills in one quarter. Dr. Jumani, he was responsible for that. And in Orlando here. In comparison, all the physicians in the state of California prescribed a total of 300,000 pills. So Orlando doctor, a half a million pills. The entire state of California, 300,000 pills. On June 3rd, 2003, MBI agents along with the OPD Drug Enforcement Division detectives conducted simultaneous search warrants on both locations, resulting in the closing of these pill mills and the emergency suspension of Dr. Jamani's medical license. On July 7th, we paid him another visit. Uh, this year, an additional search warrant was executed at the home of Louis Shapiro. He was one of the owners of the uh, pill mills. The search yielded, get this, in cardboard boxes, $985,000 in cash. $985,000 in stored in cardboard boxes. Therefore, it is important that the city of Orlando stay out in front of this issue and take appropriate steps to curtail this epidemic. Thus, the report that you're about to hear. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Kim Laskoff, who chaired the task force. Kim? Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. I'm going to provide a PowerPoint going through the findings of fact and the findings of law that the task force put together. If you recall, back in January of this year, there was an extensive presentation that you heard regarding th the problem of pill mills and, and the abuse of prescription drugs and the impacts it has on our community as well as the rest of the country. Um, as part of that, there was a moratorium put into place, and there is a provision within the, the moratorium that a task force be appointed and report to you 
the findings. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I did want to thank and mention the other task force members that I think some of them are present. We have Chief Wales from OFD. We, there's also initially there was Officer or Lieutenant Mike Favorite and then Lieutenant Eric Smith when there was a transition from OPD MBI. Uh, we have Linda Ryan Smith. I know Linda's here. Um, and Dave Arnott as well. So thank you for your participation and assistance. So um, there's also a couple other people that really need to be thanked by the task force who have helped tremendously with this. Uh, Kyle Shepard, who gave us the guidance and direction. And as usual, he put a lot of hard work into this project. And finally, I also need to thank, I don't think he's here, but Joe Cotterella. Joe is an assistant state attorney, but he's also counsel for MBI. He was a member of the task force for the county, and he was on several of their subcommittees. Um, and he attended our meetings, and he just provided a lot of information and guidance, um, which was invaluable to the task force as well. So those kudos need to go out. Um, this is what we're here about. This is an actual picture of one of the pill mills within Orlando, A Stop Pain Clinic. Um, and as you can see, they're busy places, <laughs> popular places. And what I wanted to do is we're going to go through some of the facts that were pointed out within our task force report. As the chief indicated, there are seven Floridians each day statistically who die from prescription drug, or be, drug abuse. In 2009, 5,275 persons were found to have at least one prescription drug present in their system or that was the cause of their death. And during the first half of 2010, that number was 2,579 people. Um, pursuant to the Orange County Medical Examiner statistics. In 2009, we had 100 citizens who died with a prescription drug within their system that was a cause. And in 2010, there were 146 of those deaths. Distribution in Florida. During the first half of 2010, Florida purchased more oxycodone pills than any other of the other states that were totally combined. We purchased 41 million pills. All the other states combined was only 5 million. You're going to notice during the first five months of 2011, that number went down to 925,000 as there was the prescription drug uh, monitoring program in place at that point. So we are hoping that that trend continues and makes an impact in the way it looks like it may be. Um, a statistic from the DEA is also that 92 of the top 100 distributors of oxycodone prescribers in the country were also from Florida. There's an increase in the misuse. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's a drug that is touching the young the middle and the older folks as well. It's not just for, you know, a certain age group. Um, and there was, a st there was an indication that for high school seniors, 11% in Florida and 10.7% Orange County had misused a prescription drug during their lifetime, and 3.4% of them had done so within the last month. Um, treatment, because it's becoming an overwhelming plague essentially, is having to, is, is increased. The emissions are going up, as you will see. Over the past decade, treatment emissions for opioid, I can't say that, opioid addiction had increased by five and a half percent. And those between the ages of 12 and 30 receiving treatment for prescri prescription opioid addiction in 1999 was only 500 patients, yet in 2009 that number has jumped dramatically to 7,649 people. Now these are a list of the most commonly abused prescription medications. 
And the most abused class of prescription meds are the opioids, and they are the ones that are the pain-relieving ones, which essentially uh, a pro they attach to a protein in the brain and cause a chemical reaction that essentially causes a sense of euphoria and stops, if not at all, diminishes pain. Um, so I could tell you my there was an issue with my husband. He had to go in the hospital, and he, he this uh, Delalu did. He said he took, the, within 20 seconds of it, he felt nothing. <laughs> he felt happy. He felt good. So obviously people are going to keep abusing this, un unfortunately, and then they become addicted to it because they continue to need that fix to stop the pain and, and to continue receiving that euphoric feeling. Oops. Now, the way that these are usually abused, generally one would take a pill and you orally ingest the pill. However, when the abuse starts, they will generally grind it up and they can either snort it, they can melt it down um, into a liquid form where they can inject it, uh, or when it's melted or burnt, they can inhale it like huffing. Um, or they can roll it and smoke it. Uh, the most common forms of death caused by prescription pain medications are from the injection, the smoking, and the snorting, because what happens is the release of the drug enters the bloodstream too fast, and it's overload on the body, and it kills, the, kills you. So those are the ways that it's ingested. Now, why is there such a tremendous problem with this? Why has it suddenly come to a head and such an impact? Um, in Florida in particular, a lot of the other states had had prescription drug monitoring pro programs in place. Florida, as I indicated just last fall, we got ours rolling, um, and, and fortunately, the Attorney General was, was pushing. We have more legislation on it. But Florida was the place to come because it was easy. It was easy for them to come and get them here. And it was easy for the doctors or the pain management clinics to dispense them without the legislation or regulations put into place against them. Um, these medications are easy. Everybody has some medications in their home medicine cabinets uh, that people are you know, children are taking sometimes, teenagers, other people in the home that might have access. And then there's also people breaking into residences and stealing medicines as well. As, and then I saw in Melbourne over the weekend, I think it was Saturday, a gentleman jumped over the uh, counter of a local pharmacy and he stole prescription meds, and that's all he took. So. There's also another reason this has become such a problem is there's been an increase in security at our ports of entry for our country. So it's turned more of an internal problem. We're not going outside for additional drugs. The patients have also learned to, we call it a dance, come in, my back hurts. Yeah, that's been bothering me. They engage in this with the doctor. They see him for two seconds or her for two seconds, and a script is written. And finally, what often happens is when the, after the patient's gone through this dance with the doctor and the doctor's agreed to give the prescription, the doctor writes a prescription which is generally um, sometimes a cocktail which includes several different medications so that the person walks out of there um, with oxycodone, Percocet, Soma, Xanax, all at one time. They're not just walking out with a single prescription. They're walking out with a handful of drugs. Then they're going to the other pain management clinic down the street that they engage in the same dance and walk out with a handful of drugs again. So that's where the problem is compounding. Um, this is an image, and I know it's a little blurry, but this is some cash that was actually seized by the Orlando Police Department, um, MBI, at one of the local pain management clinics. And I'm not sure if it was, I didn't write that down, but 
as you can see, it's a major cash-making uh, venture. So easy money, they're going to do it. Greedy, greedy, whether it causes uh, devastation or not. Here is a map of the city of Orlando. The light blue um, markers are indications of where the registered pain management clinics, and this is as of July 2010, or 2011, sorry. Uh, and then the darker light blue, there are four of them, are the pain management clinics that have subsequently, as the chief indicated, been shut down. So, this is causing a lot of people to die, this abuse, uh, this easy access. And some of the statistics that we've received, this is from the Florida Medical Examiner's Commission report from 2010, which identified prescription meds uh, in deceased. In Florida, from January to June 2010, apparently there were a total of 89,800 people who died in Florida from all causes. And of those deaths, there were 4,150 that were caused, they determined, by uh, a, a prescription a, a prescription medication being abused. Um, that number, the 4,150, was broken down. They determined that 715 of those were caused specifically by oxycodone. They found that there were 1,268 people that had at least one drug in their system. Obviously, some other ones had more. And this is, we're talking about the prescription drugs. Um, and 81% of all drug-related deaths, when we exclude alcohol abuse, uh, was caused, in fact, by prescription medications. So the, the statistics are quite alarming. And it makes it obvious that this issue is pressing for our community, and it's created a public health safety and welfare issue. Um, as I indicated, uh, back in January at the presentation, you heard more stats from MBI, from OPD, and from community partners who are addressing this issue as well. It's become an epidemic. And what's happened is because of the illegal diversion of these drugs, there's been increased crime. Um, you're talking about property crime as well as violent crimes. You have, as I indicated, uh, robberies occurring at pharmacies. You have home invasion robberies occurring at people's homes, um, burglaries, things like that. You have people stealing items out of people's homes or directly from them, uh, a personal, uh, from their person, in order to get the money to be able to purchase more drugs and engage in the dance with the uh, willing participants at the, at the uh, the pain management clinics that are willing to do so. You also have identity theft issues because people are playing games with their identity um, in order to now, because of the prescription, because of the PDMP, um, there, there is an increase as well in the changing who they are and stealing other people's identity so they can get more. And there's not as much of a record of the same individual obtaining those medications. Um, there's also an increase in drug sales on the street level. Um, with a large quantity of drugs, people, sometimes drug dealers will go get them, then they'll go out and they'll sell them on the street. And those drug sales, there's also an increase in organized crime. So, so something, uh, if we could do more, would be completely beneficial on all these levels. Um, as I indicated, there's, an, there's the problem with drug dependency because People abuse these medications. They continue to need these fix over and over, and they become addicted to it. Uh, it causes, obviously, much sickness and a lot of deaths. So this is the increased problem and the reasons. Now, in regard to the laws that are out there uh, within Florida to address this problem specifically, under Chapter 893 is the Florida Comprehensive Drug, Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. It essentially outlines what all the schedules of medications are and the schedules of drugs. Um, and it also outlines how they shall be distributed. 
under sections 458.3265 and 459.0137. Those are essentially statutes that mirror one another. However, they, uh, I think 458 regulates physicians, medical doctors in their dispensing of prescription medications, while 459 directly addresses osteopathic uh, providers. And I, I don't know, uh, I wasn't real familiar with the different schedules of drugs, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Scheduled one drugs are those that are high potential for abuse and have no currently accepted medical use, like heroin, cannabis, and peyote. Uh, Schedule two have a high potential for abuse and have severely restricted medical uses. Those include like cocaine and morphine that are used for medicinal purposes. Uh, their schedule three is the less potential medicines for abuse, and they have some accepted medical uses, and these include anabolic steroids and codeine, things like that. And then schedule four and schedule five are the low, low potential for abuse, and they have accepted medical uses, um, and like phenobarbital, Livium, and Valium. So, and then, so I thought that was kind of interesting. The further legislation under the statute uh, directs the Department of Health to regulate these areas. Um, they set forth certain standards of practice for physicians who are, are practicing within these pain management clinics. Um, and they include things like the maximum number of controlled substances they can prescribe or write in a particular day. They subject the pain management clinics to, to annual inspections and require them to register each year uh, with the Department of Health, and they have uh, the potential of facing a $5,000 per day uh, violation, and that, that under state statute is regulated through the Department of Health. There's additional physician regulations within these statutes that exist. Um, Physicians, they have to practice in registered pain management clinics. They're not permitted to just open one that's not registered and practice in it. That's a violation of a physician's uh, duty. They have to perform a physical exam on the same day that they are going to be prescribing the medications, not at some other day or not without a, a uh, exam at all. If they're going to be prescribing more than 72 hours worth of a medication, then they have to include in the record of the document for the patient's chart why it is that they're doing more so. Um, they have to, they've implemented some uh, restrictions on their pain, um, on their script pads, because what's happening is, and, and uh, I can tell you, I, I know from personal knowledge, I, I know someone has had somebody steal their script pad and then forge and then take it into the pharmacy so that they can get more uh, from the pharmacist. So they're making the physicians maintain security and control over those pads and utilize a particular type of counterfeit resistant pad. Um, and then they also need to, the physicians do, if they are terminating their employment and it's not, no longer working at the pain management clinic, they must notify as well. In, in June of this year, Governor Scott signed House Bill 795, or 7095. Now, basically, um, it helps to build on the existing laws in different areas and different statutes. Um, some of the main things that House Bill 795 did was it prohibited physicians from dispensing Schedule II and three substances, making it a third-degree felony if they did so at the pain management clinics. Um, it creates certain regulatory requirements for the physicians who actually uh, prescribe the controlled substances uh, in order to treat the chronic non-cancer pain, regardless of whether it, it's, it's a health care center or a pain management clinic or whatever uh, setting they want to reference it as. They also, under House Bill uh, 7095, there were regulations put into place against wholesale distributors because um, there was a big gap there. There was no regulation stopping the huge ordering of the prescription medications from 
the wholesalers to, and in creating this huge surplus to be on site of these uh, facilities. So some of the regulations that we thought were uh, important were that the wholesalers are electronically to submit a monthly report of its distributions of controlled substances to the Department of Health. They have to maintain certain policies to review the credentials of the physicians and the pharmacies who are purchasing the medications, as well as procedures to identif identify and prevent when uh, there are concerns of suspicious, suspicious transactions occurring. And it's kind of putting a little bit of a burden onto the wholesalers as well as when they see that there's been more than 5,000 5, doses of a particular prescription medication, they need to assess the reasonableness of that order. Is it, is it truly uh, an order or is it somebody who is just wanting to, um, for some unlawful reason, amass a large amount of, of this medication? Some of the things within the House bill will become effective on January 1st of this year, or of this upcoming year, and those things include that physicians and pharmacies, they have to maintain a log that um, lists all of the prescriptions that are dispensed. And there is also going to be a provision that that log is going to be accessible to law enforcement upon demand and the Department of Health upon demand. It's not going to require a search warrant or subpoena or anything like that. It's simply you got to turn it over. Okay, so that's that's a, that's a pretty big tool. Um, it's going to be required that physicians have to comply with certain standards of care for prescribing controlled substances. It seems pretty common sense that one would normally do these things. However, um, it's not happening. And that's why, as I explained earlier, the patients engage in this dance and are able to get away with it, as well as the uh, unscrupulous physicians who are engaging in the same dance and just handing it over in order to get the payment. Um, they're going to have to actually obtain a patient history, conduct the exam. They're going to have to document that exam. Um, they're going to assess the patient's risk of abuse for prescription medications. Um, you know, if someone's coming in and obviously appears to be an addict, that's going to lay on them to assess whether or not it's a legitimate injury and they, in fact, need the medication for that purpose. Um, they're going to have to obtain informed consent. And they're going to have to periodically review uh, the patients, uh, you know, how often they get treatment and the visits and assess the records for that. They can't just visit the person and put, tuck the file away and be done with it, okay? And they are going to also be required that if they see there is a need for referral to perhaps drug treatment uh, or some other type of specialist associated with this, then they are going to have a burden of referring those individuals to obtain that treatment. As I indicated in the fall of last year, um, under the 893, the state statute, the prescription drug monitoring program um, was, was created. And that prescription drug monitoring program, actually, the reporting just began, began on September 1, uh, 2011. And I think I heard on the news over the weekend, and I was trying to find the statistic, but I, I thought I had heard it, that since September 1 to the current date, there's been a, port, a reported, I think they said 18 million um, reported uh, indications to the PDMP. So it's it's logging a lot of information. So um, all dispensing physicians and pharmacies, they're the ones that are required to, every time they dispense, they have to report to this thing, okay? Um, and that report has to be done within seven days of the dispensing of the transaction. It doesn't have to be done on the same day. It can be done within seven days of that. And they call it this E-Force, which Electronic Florida Online Reporting of Controlled Substances Evaluation. So that's their official little header, so in the bottom right. Now, 
after assessing all of the factual um, ramifications of this of the prescription drug abuse problem on our community and as we went through the laws that existed um, we came up with some recommendations and these are those recommendations we think it's important to continue to support public awareness of the issue um, and support our community partners like the Orange County Health Department, uh, Orange County Coalition for a Drug-Free Community, and the other uh, public interest groups that are addressing this huge problem in our community. Some of the things that they're doing is uh, teaching people about how you properly dispose of your unused drugs, and in fact, doing that. Um, perhaps a loved one who has needed lots of medications for a, a treatment of a life-threatening illness suddenly passes and you have all these prescription drugs still in your medicine cabinet. How do you properly dispose of those? Um, continue to support the prescription drug take-back days. On the bottom of the slide, there's five bags um, from one of our recent take-back days, and, you, and those are big. It's kind of condensed, but those are big garbage bags. So you can see how many medications we are collecting just in the simple day of doing this thing. Um, encourage parents, encourage seniors to actually keep track of your medications. Um, if you start to notice that your meds are running low quickly or disappearing, then you need to be aware of that and know how to take action. Um, and also, obviously, a lot of folks don't know what the dangers of taking too much hydrocodone. My back's hurting, so I'm just going to keep taking it. Well, the, the community needs to understand and individuals need to understand how it can quickly be abused and, and turn deadly, literally. The second prong of the task force recommendation is that we adopt an ordinance. Um, an ordinance to supplement the state statutes that are in place. Um, and some of the points that we are requesting and recommending be in that ordinance are that we prohibit the pain management from dispensing meds on site. No more of that. Just write a prescript and then that's it. Okay. Um, and the other thing is that we require physicians and pharmacists to check the PDMP before they dispense because under <coughs> state law all they have to do is enter the data. The unscrupulous doctors aren't going to check. They don't care. They're just going to enter their data and comply with the law. Generally a physician who follows the proper standard of care will do that, but we are requiring that. We are also recommending certain operational regulations be put into place. Um, where we would restrict the hours of operation, that the uh, PMCs provide adequate parking and sufficient indoor waiting room area. On the bottom of this image, it's actually one of the pain management clinics in town uh, that was closed down. It's Pain Relief Orlando. And you can see the line is just out the door, and a lot of complaints arise at these locations because what happens is they have such a small area inside there's not enough room so you have these folks either lining up outside the building sitting in their cars loitering in the parking lots which are often in strips of other businesses legitimate businesses um, and you, you can see the complaints that are going to arise and, and the possibility of increased thefts things like that Okay, so we're recommending that there be enough parking and that there be enough indoor waiting area to uh, provide. We're also recommending that these be restricted to certain zoning districts in which they're separated from other pain management clinics, a certain distance between the, the you know, one pain management clinic to another, so there can't be one here and one right next door. Um, we separate them from schools, a distance from pharmacies, and residential areas as well. And we're asking that they comply with crime prevention principles, which includes proper lighting, you know, shrubs that aren't overgrown, so things like that.
And the final part of this is to address the aspect of accountability of these facilities. Um, we're going to recommend that they annually register with the city. They provide business records, which include the number of prescriptions written for certain medications, the number of patients they see, and the state of residence of the persons to whom the medicines are dispensed. A lot of these uh, folks you'll find come from all over the country because Florida is an easy place. It was, in particular, to get these drugs. Um, and then also they provide the log of their attempts to access the uh, PDMP. We'd also ask that um, they provide reports relating to the identification of those that work in it, the owners and the employees, um, a copy of their uh, driver's license of these employees and, and the operators and owners' driver's license, if they have any criminal histories, as well as what their home address is. Um, and we were, are recommending that these things be uh, provided to, and we could work on this, but to the chief administrator, so Mr. Brooks. So. Um, that's our recommendation. We'll figure it out. Those are the outlines of the key points or the things that we think would be beneficial in an ordinance to help beef up the existing state statutes um, in thwarting this problem. Now the timeline for all of this and, and the way that um, we were perhaps seeing that the things would go is um, a proposed ordinance would need to be presented to uh, MPB in December because a lot of these issues deal with zoning. Um, we also wanted to present this issue, um, uh, the proposed ordinance to focus groups. I know the county has done um, a ton of uh, focus groups on this issue, and we've had the benefit of their uh, um, what's happened at those as well. But it would be great to have some focus groups on our proposed ordinance um, to make sure that we're not improperly missing something, perhaps from an industry, perhaps a hospital or Walgreens or something like that, just something that we're not necessarily experts in. Um, on January 1st, if you recall, I believe the moratorium for the city went into place this past February. It expires January 1st. So what we're asking is um, and recommending is that council extend it by 30 days to give us a little more time to run on this um, and then adopt an ordinance uh, with these things that we are recommending. Um, that's the timeline and the, and the frame of things that we were thinking would occur. Now, I thought this image was, I, I came across this on the internet and I thought it was it's kind of disturbing, but it was really telling at the same time. It makes a huge impact and it addresses exactly, you know, what we're talking about today. So. Um, for my PowerPoint presentation of the task force report, I am done. But up next is going to be Carol Burkett, uh, the director of the Orange County Drug Free Coalition. Um, she's been a staff you member. Want to ask a couple questions. Oh, I'm um, sorry. And maybe this, I guess, it goes to you probably. Um, the state regulations that were passed um, don't preempt us from also regulating in the same area? No, not on these issues, no. Okay, and then I guess you'll address the, where the county is in terms of their process, right? Sorry. Commissioner Sheehan? Yeah, uh, Kim, I had a couple questions. Um, yes, ma'am. You know, those of us who obtain our prescriptions legally, <laughs> you know, you, you go in and there's, a, there's, you know, I mean, a, my, my uh, pharmacy gets freaked out if I try to refill it a week early from traveling right. or something. So how is it they can get so many at one time? Is it because... The, the clinics are, are doing it on site, and is there some different, can they, is there, is there not a limit as to how much they can prescribe at a time? There's a limit um, of, they're not supposed to supply more than a 72 hour, but if they document their file and the patient's gone through the dance, then they can dispense it. And yes, they're dispensing it on site. Um, and what's happening is that, as you saw, we had, um, I think it was 19, 
and I'm not sure if uh, how many of those are legitimate, legitimate versus unlegitimate, but uh, or illegitimate. Okay. <laughs> but they travel from one, and within a you know a morning's period, they'll go to five different uh, facilities, and then they'll just start filling those prescriptions. Okay, so they can get 72 hours at a time, but then they go, and they can get numerous prescriptions of that 72 hour. Can amount. they get what? They can get numerous prescriptions. Like you said, they, they will get a, co a cocktail. They right. Can get, they, they, they're not just getting one prescription. They're getting several prescriptions of the 72 hour at a time then? Oftentimes they are. Okay. Right. Um, um, what zoning districts are we talking about putting these in? Because I was looking at the map, and I was looking at Highway 50, and I'm sure Commissioner Ortiz was looking at 436. <laughs> so, um, IG. Really, IG. Okay, that's, that's good. That will definitely restrict <laughs> it a lot. And... Um, Certainly, I think setting the moratorium is a good idea. You certainly have my support. And I just had one other question um, about closing down. You know, are we going to do any grandfathering in or anything like that? I mean, I, w I think we'd like to see closing down the existing. Do we have to grandfather these in mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form? Um, I'm asking the lawyer. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's something that we would probably, we've not really delved into that. That's um, not an issue we've addressed yet. But okay. I would, it would depend on the ramifications legally of how it would impact them and things like that. So. Okay, but I think if we if we put enough restrictions on it, though, it would probably, you know, get to the point where they, it wouldn't be as lucrative, and hopefully we'll see some of these go away. That's the hope. Okay, okay. That's thanks, Mayor. Let's go ahead. Commissioner Diamond, then Commissioner Warner. Um, thank you, um, thank you, Kim. I wanted to ask you first of all, um, when you talk about a requirement for physicians to check the PDMP before they write a prescription, would that be just for um, certain types of drugs or would that be for anything, even if you're taking your child in for an earache or something, would they have to check for antibiotics no, we and things like oh, that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, we were thinking specifically to the Schedule 2 and Schedule 3, or is it, yeah, I think it's the Schedule 2 and the Schedule 3, the most abused classes is the ones that we were considering that for. Okay. Well, I, I would agree with that approach. You sure don't want to, you know, Restrict the, you know, restrict medicine where there's absolutely no possibility of this kind of problem. Right. Um, and uh, Commissioner Sheehan asked what zoning district this would be permitted in. Where are they permitted now? What zoning? Is it any commercial zoning district? Um, the zoning more so expert uh, is indicating yes, it's pretty much any commercial zoning district currently. Okay. And. Um, how many new new pain management clinics have there been, say, in the past year? Or I guess we've had the moratorium, so people may not have got, come forward, but have there been applications? Have there been other people that have wanted to do this? Um, my understanding is there haven't been any that have uh, opened since the moratorium in, was in place okay. in February. Okay. And then um, I saw that you had statistics for the first five months of the year. Um, do you have anything for the time period after the new state law came into effect that might help us understand the impact of the new state law and how that's impacting all this? All I have is the one statistic where I think I indicated that we went from 43 or 42 million, something like that, down to 925,000 uh, units of a prescription. Uh, I think that was at the beginning. Um, Statistic-wise, um, that were purchased oxycodone pills, there was 41 million. That and then once the PDMP, it was down to uh, the 925,000. Other statistics I don't have, um, and I also since it was actually just the September one that they've been actually required to utilize it, I have I don't have statistics that recent either. Okay, I, I think at some point maybe by the time you're able to come back with an ordinance, I think it'd be interesting to see that as well. Okay. But, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Lyon. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the report. Um, I've been a social worker since 1969, and almost none of this is new. But what is new is that we are paying attention to it, and we paid so much attention to the nuisance drug traffickers, and we still need to while these people were getting rich and killing people for years. Yes, ma'am. Um, so looking at the uh, pain management clinics and the meth labs, 
uh, we just had to do something. And I guess better late than never, but I believe that uh, I'm not going to vote for anything that's going to grandfather anybody in um, because um, uh, in Paramore, we grandfathered in so many bad things that we're still stuck with them. And I think we ought to be smarter than that for the future in terms of grandfathering in bad behavior. And I'm not sure all the restrictions will control that. So we have to, in my opinion, I'd rather get sued and deal with it in court uh, than grandfather anyone in. Um, the other part is I, I don't know whether anyone saw the special on uh, current TV that dealt with Florida's pain management clinics. It's been on a hundred times, uh, and the best time to watch is like two o'clock in the morning. But um, <laughs> after its original, <laughs> but it didn't just dwell about Florida and oxycontin and codeine and all the other uh, um, situations, but the significant impact Florida's pain clinics are having in Kentucky in other northern corridors where they come here, pack up, then buy their prescriptions and sell them. Um, aside from crack cocaine, the pain management clinics have created more family divisions and children in foster care and living with grandparents that one of the things we, while we were in Phoenix just um, this past week, is Phoenix is a building a grandparents' housing facility where grandparents who are taking care of the grandkids because their kids are in jail or whatever um, and, and now in a situation and making it affordable and whatnot, that Kentucky was one of the primary uh, meth lab locations and a pain management clinic uh, addictions. You're talking about opiates. Um, that was one of the centers, uh, Alabama and some of the others, but Kentucky and West Virginia were the primary ones. Mm -hmm. So I would like to, whenever, wherever, and this is for our police, wherever there is a pain management clinic now to construct or install one of our iris cameras. I think um, that is no, um, those people stand out there in the streets, it's a public place, and I think everything going on at those clinics, we ought to have an iris camera right down on them. And when they move there, they just keep the cameras tracking behind them. But my question is, I wonder how many of those doctors who had so, dis so little disregard for life could be doing something illegal, still not counting their prescriptions, still maybe go underground with some of this behavior. Um, uh, how are we tracking the potential for that kind of behavior, knowing that if you're already um, a killer, you're a bad person, all you're going to do is look for some way to maintain your quality of life <laughs> for doing wrong, and you can go deeper. I mean, are we investigating those kinds of behaviors? Um, I think with some of the recommendations as well as the existing um, statutory requirements, we're requiring more accountability on the parts of the pain management clinics as well as the physicians. So I think as well as, as if you recall, I also mentioned the requirement that the log is available um, to law enforcement upon inspection, just uh, upon request. Um, I, I'm thinking that those will be extra tools that will help to track, you know, if we see that one doctor sells, you know, this crazy amount of prescription medications versus the rest of the physicians, you know, are down here, that will send off a signal to law enforcement, I would think, to do that, to track that down and to follow but up. But do why. they actually keep accurate records? That was my concern. If your doctor... The doctors, or, you mean? Yeah, the doctors and nurses or technicians in those clinics, do they actually, if I go in for a prescription, and I'm not going to tell anybody I'm going to take those meds to West Virginia. Right. So I'm not going to report the doctor. <laughs> so the doctor may not. It's just, unfortunately, it's one of those uh, self-regulating <laughs> things that we have to, um, we can ask them to do it. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, so we know the answer to that. They're cheating. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, the other, I remember, um, a lot of people may know this, because I remember I was in the hospital after several surgeries, 
I'm allergic to fentanyl. I didn't even know it was one of those horrible things, and I'm allergic to morphine. I'm allergic to penicillin. Oh, my goodness. But I was prescribed oxycodone once at their surgery. <laughs> then I heard about that radio personality. That it <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't say how to dispense the drugs, and I've worked for years on dispense, you know, how to, do, how not dispense, how to uh, dispose. dispose of your drugs. <clears throat> and flushing them down the toilet is not a good way to dispose of them because it <laughs> contaminates your water That's supply. True. So we need on our, on, our, on our campaign and dealing with all of this as we move forward, um, a, a great piece when we do public service ads is to help people beyond taking your prescriptions back mm -hmm. uh, to some place. People may not have mobility or may have other issues. So we have got to help people um, dispose of these drugs. I like the idea of giving it to the mailman. Let him take them somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're handicapped, you can't get out. And you don't have your little grandkids. I wouldn't give my two grandkids anyway. They'd be out on the street selling them. But we've got to be creative on how to dispose of these drugs where they are in a safe place for, for seniors who usually someone has died right. and they're left with all these drugs and the grandkids or kids come in and they know how to dispose of them right. straight on the streets. So I am so supportive of this, but I'm as supportive of this as I am of meth labs and uh, dealing with that and nuisance drugs. But I think we always have to go after the guys who are making the big money because these little guys running around here on the bicycles, I mean, they're a dime a dozen. So we need to stop the um, not only pain clinic, um, um, management clinics, but all the other drugs, and make them just as important in terms of dealing with it so we don't have to deal with the profiling issues. We just deal with the issue of criminality. Right. But thank you for that great report. And I like to be engaged on uh, some of the things we've done through the past. I mean, I don't know. I know, I know I'm a social worker. <laughs> I'm a clinician and have been. So there are things we've done in the past that people don't talk about anymore that right. maybe we can bring back to the forefront. Thank you. Thank Commissioner you. Ings. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your report. Uh, um, one question that I did have was one that uh, Commissioner Lynham brought up, and that was reference disposing of these drugs. So how do you properly dispose of the drugs? If I can uh, interrupt, I'm sorry. Okay. Call you police chief. Mayor, commissioners, uh, actually uh, a couple Saturdays, Saturdays ago we had a disposal day where at all the substation, it, substations, OPD substations and so forth, we um, had folks come in and we actually collected, I want to say, Carol, 450 pounds, 450 pounds. So all the substations, Northwest, uh, Primrose, uh, Secpo down on Pershing Ave, and it was advertised in the Sentinel on the news and so forth. And these folks brought them all in. And, and I'm with you, Commissioner. There's some folks that maybe aren't able to get out of the house. Uh, but if they call us, we do go and we'll, we'll properly dispose of them. But we had 450 pounds, big old garbage bags of all these prescription drugs. We just held it two Saturdays ago. Uh, it was Lloyd Randolph's last day with the Orlando Police Department. Right. He's uh, retired. But anyways, uh, that was his big... Uh, <laughs> Hurrah, I should say. So, so once you gather them up, Chief, how do you dispose, dispose of, them. of them? We um, work with DEA, I believe, and, and properly dispose of them. I'm, maybe Carol can answer that. I'm not sure how, <laughs> what the process is, but we I know we, we take good, good custody of them and, and um, properly dispose of them. Okay. That's, my, that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> This is a, a great topic, by the way. I enjoy working with uh, law enforcement on the take-back days. And as you mentioned, DEA helps organize this nationally. We had 17 locations. Orlando Police Department did a fantastic job. And um, once DEA collects all the medications, then they have sites where they incinerate everything. Okay. So uh, it's no questions asked. You can have your information on the label. No one's going to take any of that down. And then it's all incinerated. So it's a great way to get rid of anything unwanted, expired, and just get it out of those medicine cabinets. Carol, do you pharmacies take back medicine? They don't. Uh, right now they'd have to have a reverse license and it's very difficult mm -hmm. to do. We've talked with Walgreens and CVS. Um, 
So right now, the take-back days are really the only way to get rid of those. We do have a campaign, um, Commissioner Lynham, we're starting where we can give people those instructions on how to do this. It's a kind of a, a multi-step process where you want to black out your information on your prescription bottle. You want to fill it with some undes put water in it, mix it with coffee grounds, something where people just aren't going to pick it right <laughs> off the trash. Um, but something DEA has presented and uh, they're looking at over the next year is how to be able to give back those prescriptions to your pharmacist. So they can legally take hold of those. Uh, right now you can purchase during any other time when we don't have a take back day. You can go to Walgreens or CVS for a couple of dollars and there's a prescription disposal bag and then you can send those um, to the federal government and they can dispose of those. But right now pharmacists just can't take them back. Uh, they would like to but they're not able to at this time. Commissioner, do you have more or can we just go ahead and segue to Carol? She's going to give, do a presentation. Yeah, I, I did have just, okay. just two more. Thank you, okay. Mayor. Um, the, the other was we talked about um, restricted hours, recommended restricted hours, and basically what would that be for a business? We, we weren't sure. I think the county's uh, recommending 7 to 7. We had looked at 8 to 8, and theirs is restricted to Mondays through Fridays. But then you have other physicians that are sometimes open on Saturday. So as a task force, we were discussing, well, maybe limited hours on a Saturday, um, and do it does during the week does it really need to be open at seven every day of the week and open to eight every day of the week thing or you, you know what I mean that that window does it need to be that large all the days a week and do we want to include um, a weekend day because some physicians are open on a Saturday so and those that, are what we're considering and then would the ordinance have some sanctions for non-compliance of doctors that violate the uh, our rules are our well they're going to be um, under our code 1.08 which are essentially second degree misdemeanors that can be punishable by 60 days in jail and or a $500 fine and or six months of probation so those sanctions are um, what we have we could also um, we hadn't thought about um, we, we could address it to um, making certain financial administrative fine type of deals for other offenses depending on the degrees of them so those are our options but as it is now and and then the probably the last thing is having to do with the uh, stats that you mentioned uh, specifically with the medical examiner deaths in Orange County in 2009 and 2010 but are they are there figures so far for 2011 say the first six months or the first nine months I don't have them but I can do my best to try and see if they have them and get them for you and, and then if we can kind of drill down a little bit we talk about Orange County stats but what are the true stats for the city of Orlando uh, in all categories where we mention stats and and that's where I'll kind of leave it mayor so that you can we can move on but uh, okay. I was concerned specifically about you know what's really happening in the city limits of Orlando it's good to know that we had 21 pain uh, clinics but we closed four so we're doing good in that area but what specifically is happening as it relates with death and usage of um, these drugs or and I'm, I was just gonna say I'm not sure we'll be able to assess that because um, it is through the county mm -hmm. that the deaths are reported through the Ninth Circuit which is Orange and Osceola County um, and then they just break it down by counties I, I'm not aware that they actually break it down by cities but I will see if that is something that we can assess and obtain well, yeah I'm sure we can get that information <laughs> from the medical examiner as it relates to the city of Orlando and that's all yes, I have sir. there thank okay. you Commissioner Commissioner Ortiz thank you mayor thank you for the presentation that's thank great you. Uh, it's obvious that the cost-benefit ratio for these clinics is just tremendous. The cost of doing business is nothing compared to the benefit they're having, which brings to my mind the, the question, if we don't increase the penalty in the sense of instead of being a misdemeanor or making it a felony, and if we don't put a harsher sanctions, they will still be taking risks because there's so much money to be made here. So the, uh, besides trying to completely ban them from, from being able to disburse these, uh, these pills, 
what is how are we going to be uh, auditing them? Because we can put all the regu regulations we want, but how we'll be able to keep up with them and be able are we going to maintain? We're going to create a special task force or a special group within the police departments that their sole purpose will be to continue checking on these clinics, or, or what's going to be happening here? That specifically I couldn't answer, but I would assume that, uh, like we generally do, I, I guess Chief Rooney can answer that. <laughs> just, just like anything else, we would have to send undercover officers in to see if they're complying with the new stipulations. Uh, checks and balances, that's the best we could do. Okay. And I just have one more question, a quick one. I see those dots on Semeron, which really concern me, because I see that a couple of them have been closed, but I see all the three light blue ones. Where are those located at? If I may, I mean, if we can, oh, can disperse that. Yeah, I'll have to send that to you. I don't, I don't know them off okay. the top of my head. I know Wolco Way we did close down, and, of course, okay. uh, Commissioner Diamond knows about the South Orange one because he was there that day. Okay. I just want to make sure my, my community is informed about this. Was he there when you closed it, or was he there in line? <laughs> <laughs> no, let me, let me correct that. He was there to, to observe the closing of yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Bill. Was he subject? Was he subject? That does leave an unanswered question. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Sheehan for I just had one more. This, this might actually be um, <laughs> more, more proper for Carol for the, for the segue. But, um, you know, we do kicks for guns and we get lots of, you know, uh, attention from the radio stations because I didn't know about the to give, I mean, I'm a commissioner. I didn't know to give that out to my district, so I was kind of distressed by that. So if we could do something a little more high profile, like kicks for guns, maybe cards for drugs, I don't know, something like that, to really kind of play it up, um, you know, to make it more of a media event so that we can get people understanding, you know, that this is important, this is the way that we need to do this. And I agree with Commissioner Lanham that, you know, flushing them down the toilet, you know, contaminates the water supply. We need to get people to do this safely. we Will do, Commissioner. Thank you. All right, Carol, come on up. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. Thank you for having me here. And I absolutely agree with you, Commissioner. The more we can do to advertise the take back days, the better it is for our community. So getting that um, that push will, will make everyone informed about this. Um, I'm here today with Dana Crosby Collier. She's uh, Assistant County Attorney. And we're going to be discussing uh, Mayor Jacobs Prescription Drug Task Force, highlighting some of the recommendations for you. You also have a folder in front of you that gives you um, the PowerPoint today, as well as the recommendations from our health care and pharmacy and a proposed ordinance, and it's in this folder, along with some information about our task force. Mayor Jacobs created the Prescription Drug Task Force in June. The, the goal was to have a comprehensive approach to the non-medical misuse of prescription drugs, the proliferation of pain clinics, which we've talked to a lot today, uh, working with enforcement, health care, pharmacies, education, prevention, treatment, and ultimately public policy that will come out of this. The structure of the task force, Mayor Jacobs asked former Mayor Crotty to chair the task force. It was co-chaired by Dr. George Rawls. He's our Orange County Medical Director, and he's also an emergency physician with Orlando Regional. It was an 18-member task force, some key community leaders, and you have that list within your packet. And we want to thank uh, Mayor and Commissioners having Chief Rooney and Deputy Chief Robinson, who served on that task force. We appreciate their help. Uh, the task force held three meetings, and those were the entire member, the 18-member task force. But they established two subcommittees, the Enforcement Subcommittee and the Health Care and Pharmacy. And that's really where they developed the recommendations that we're going to be presenting to you today. Um, the goals of the task force were to look at the extent of the prescription drug problem, review state and local ordinances. At the time, there was about 30 local ordinances. As we know, moratoriums are ending across the state. Ordinances are being put in place, so I guarantee there's more than 30 now in our state. Looking at determining the need for substantive regulations for pain management clinics and then ultimately providing a comprehensive action plan. I want to tell you today the Board of County Commissioners have not reviewed the recommendations that you have in front of you. It will be coming to them in the very near future during a work session. Now, I'm not going to list all these names, but I just want to show you the volume of people that participated on the enforcement and health care and pharmacy subcommittees. You can see the chairs were our task force members, Sheriff Jerry Demings, Joe Cotterella, who took a very lead role. He's with the state attorney's office and general counsel to MBI, chaired that enforcement committee. Marlon Hutchins, vice president of Walgreens, and Dr. Charles Chase. He's a doctor of osteopathic medicine. Um, at Winnie Palmer and with the anesthesiologists of Greater Orlando. Those co-chairs decided early 
on to form jointly. So the committees were talking amongst all the different disciplines. And as you can see, there are task force members, then about other 48 members in total that wanted to be a part of this subcommittee. You see physicians, you see pain management clinics, attorneys representing those pain management clinics, attorneys representing um, the Florida Medical Association. We had a good representation from law enforcement. Our pharmacists, independent pharmacists, were also participants. We had treatment professionals on board, and we had a few community advocates, people that suffer from chronic pain that wanted to make sure their voice was heard. So they met during this entire period from July till October 31st, and we concluded that task force, the subcommittee met jointly seven times to discuss the recommendations. And that just shows you the entire list. Dana Crosby and myself were staff to the task force. The first recommendation that I want to share with you is on the healthcare and pharmacy side, increasing healthcare provider education, misuse and abuse. We want to do this through forums and webinars. As you can see, this is not the entire list. You have that in your packet from family physicians to board of realtors to the Florida Retail Federation, dentist, podiatrist, orthopedic, uh, working with Orlando Hospital and Florida Hospital residency programs, OBGYN. We're seeing more drug-exposed babies uh, now, and 50% of those that we see are opiate-addicted. Actually, Orange County and Orlando is third in the state with the number of opiate-addicted babies. So this is something that we need to do more education on. And also, that's not on this list on the slide, is Florida Realtors. And you might think that's an odd one that we need to educate, but they are seeing diversion of prescription drugs when people are coming in to say they're looking at a their potential home buyer when really they're going in to divert medication from that uh, homeowner's medicine cabinet. So that's one that we discovered through some conference calls with FDLE. That's a population we need to educate on. Increasing prescription education awareness, pharmacists play a key role. They are um, someone that we know in disseminating information to the patients. It's a very vital role that they can educate them about the proper use, the disposal of those medications, also our independent community pharmacies. If you haven't heard, and there's been some articles in the paper and even on the news where we've seen a jump in pharmacy applications in the state, um, by about June or July when we had our first task force meeting, the state had already received over 450 new applications for pharmacists. So that causes an alarm with some because those just aren't the Walgreens and CVS, your large retails, those are independents, which leads you to believe they could be getting out of the business of a pain management clinic and getting into the pharmacist side where they can still dispense. Um, the prescription drug toolkit was something that Kentucky did very successfully. They distributed that over to a thousand pharmacists and this is something that the task force looked at and wants to replicate here in Orange County. You heard a lot about our prescription drug take back day. We did our third one on October 29th. Um, total was 835 pounds for Orange County at 17 collection sites, but City of Orlando did a tremendous job. 470 pounds of that came from them. And just to let you know, in two take back days, Central Florida has collected over 5,700 pounds of medication. And that's more than the entire state of Ohio. So um, we obviously need more of these and, and need to do more in education so people know when these occur and then how to dispose of those on a regular basis. This is probably one of the key recommendations of the healthcare and pharmacy side is information sharing of prescription drug abuse and misuse data. We uh, want to raise awareness on the issue, determine trends and patterns before they get to the medical examiner's office. A key component of this is working with our hospitals. And we've already started conversations with them to identify ICD-9 codes when people are coming into the emergency room as a visit or an admission and starting to look at patterns of prescription drug abuse and misuse. Um, as you can see, the medical examiner's report, Commissioner, as you asked, typically that comes out mid-year for the first half. So for 2011, we probably won't see anything until July. Um, we did ask for, for our, both of our task forces to break that down. So we, those numbers that you saw earlier by Mrs. Laskoff is just for Orange County. So we separated Osceola out, and hopefully they can drill down further mm -hmm. to the city of Orlando. Uh, but listening to Dr. Um, Dr. G, it's not slowing down for 2011. Mm -hmm. She said it looks like we will surpass our numbers of 146 deaths in Orange County wow. when we look at 2011, when that year ends. So. Um, we'll, look, um, we'll look to getting that data and then disseminating that to you all. But obviously our treatment centers are seeing an impact on this. We know that their numbers are going up dramatically and the majority of people they are treating are opiate addicted. I mentioned the drug exposed babies, poison control, and then our self-reported use surveys. We want to make sure that we keep track of this data so we can better answer it through prevention enforcement and treatment recommendations. 
Uh, prescription drug education and awareness. Obviously, we've mentioned this, parents and seniors are a key component. We need to make sure that they're, they're educated on what the most abused drugs are, then how they can track those and lock up their medicine cabinets so it does not get diverted. Working with our community-based agencies, our faith-based um, campus health prof uh, professionals, our providers, there's so many folks that and sectors we want to reach out to in various ways from just material distribution to webinars, forums, and trainings. And that concludes my piece of this presentation. I'd like to now turn it over to Dana Crosby Collier. Hey, Commissioner, can we go ahead go and ahead. get go ahead. through the presentation, then we'll do okay. questions for both. Good morning. Pleasure well, to be here. We're going to just run through the enforcement subcommittee um, objectives and recommendations, and those actually um, made their way into a, about a 19-page ordinance that's a part of the packet we'll present to our Board of County Commissioners, um, as Carol mentioned, soon. The objectives of the enforcement subcommittee were to review state legislation and existing local ordinances. Now, the, um, the county enacted a moratorium about a year ago. It went into effect on December 15th of last year. And at that time, um, an unofficial staff work group was established to start looking at what we were going to do. And we did begin that process with Joe Cottrell and others involved that went on to become a part of the task force. And at that time, we had a state law in effect. Well, the legislature came into session. They enacted Senate, um, House Bill 7095, and a lot of the rules changed. So we, we were um, shuffling fast at some points to, to review state legislation because it was morphing on us. And we also, as Carol mentioned, we were looking at existing local ordinances. Those relate to permitting, land use, zoning, substantive regulations, um, moratoriums were being entered into, they were being extended. So we were really watching a lot of activity. Collect information on prescription drug related arrests in the community and work jointly with the Health Care and Pharmacy Committee on strategies. Once the task force was formed, we started with the joint subcommittee meetings. And then, of course, further training of law enforcement agencies on prescription drug investigation and prosecution. That was just some cooperative efforts that the enforcement subcommittee worked on. As I mentioned, we reviewed House Bill 7095. This is a list of some of the early, um, just kind of a, gives you a, a feel for what the others were doing, the other counties and cities. We had operational regulations. Sarasota really took the lead on this. Um, Hillsborough County was an early starter with Tampa, also enacting a very similar ordinance to Hillsborough County. Pinellas County does not have a um, business tax receipt structure like most counties do and cities as well. So they enacted a registration uh, system that was totally separate and they have continued to take the lead in, in their regulations. Um, Maitland was the first that we knew of to regulate pharmacies. Um, Satellite Beach was one of the first ordinances that um, we reviewed that, that talked about how you would regulate pain management clinics and all the daily reporting. A lot of that language has found its way into our ordinances, our ordinance and other ordinances that we've seen. Um, after House Bill 7095 was enacted by the legislature, before it took effect, the, the Orlando Sentinel reported on a number of loopholes on May 10th of 2011. They said, you know, we noticed that doctors and pharmacists aren't really required to check the prescription drug monitoring program prior to giving patients drugs. Well, they weren't exactly sure that this, this has always been an issue with the PDMP. Okay, the information, if you're not required to check it, if you're not required to report, um, this is a problem. They also noted that board certified pain specialists such as anesthesiologists and others were not required to register with the state as a pain management clinic. And the reply the state gave was, well, those aren't really the doctors that cause problems, but that was identified as a loophole. Another issue that um, is a, was identified as a loophole and something we discussed briefly in our subcommittees was that there was no drug testing required of patients. So you have to write, as a doctor, you have to write a detailed treatment plan. You have to monitor your patient for abuse, but you're not actually drug testing that patient to ensure that that patient is taking the drugs that you're prescribing for that patient. So we, we seriously considered these identified loopholes as well as others that um, were identified in our subcommittee as we worked through our process. I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Um, the first proposed recommendation that we came up with was to define the term dangerous drug. What is this? This is a drug that's causing a lot of problems. It's specifically an opiate analgesic. It's listed in Schedule 2 or 3. 
It's supposed to be very narrow, and we didn't, we wanted to note in our findings of fact that these are not always dangerous, it's just the way they're used by ab abusers <laughs> that make them dangerous, or maybe unlawfully prescribed that make them dangerous. So that became um, an issue for, for us. We need to really define what it is we're looking at, and everything we did grew from this definition of dangerous drugs including what is a pain management clinic. Um, our enforcement subcommittee looked at pain management clinic as it's defined in the law, and as we noted, there are loopholes in the definition that were noted early on by the Sentinel, but we also identified other loopholes as we worked through our process and decided that for purposes of a local ordinance, the enforcement subcommittee wanted to recommend to the board that they more stringently define what is a pain management clinic. That will be it can be called anything because they go by various titles, wellness center, urgent care facilities, detox center. But that entity would have to have at least one of the following characteristics. And one thing that was heavily discussed and heavily debated and um, very heavily discussed was uh, the issuance of prescriptions for a dangerous drug. And remember, that's that very narrowly defined class of drugs to more than 20 patients in a single day. Um, holds itself out through a sign or advertising in any medium as being in the business to prescribe or dispense pain medication. Holding itself out through a sign or advertising that it's in a business to treat or manage pain and then actually does dispense the dangerous drugs or meets the state definition of pain management clinic. We looked at the exceptions in the law, we debated them, discussed them, had a lot of healthy discussion on the exceptions, and finally decided that um, the following entities should be exempt, accepted from our definition of pain management clinic. They're licensed as a hospital or other licensed facility of that nature, that's in the law. Majority of physicians who provide services in the clinic are primarily surgical providers, that's also in the law. Affiliated with an accredited medical school in the current law, does not prescribe or dispense controlled substances for treatment of pain, that's in the law, and we added this one, operated for the sole purpose of serving a governmental entity. That could be, for example, our jail. Um, some things that are, were included in the law in the last session, 7095 reflects the, these um, next two exceptions that we did not include in our local definition. Wholly owned or operated by board certified anesthesiologists, physiatrists, or neurologists, wholly owned or operated by one or more board-certified board medical specialists who have completed a fellowship. Um, those are in the 7095. They're not in our proposed recommendations to the board. We included some registration and operational regulations for PMCs. Once you meet the definition of PMC, then these would kick in. These proposed um, operational regs include monthly business records. The PMC would provide, this is very similar to um, what uh, Ms. Laskoff described, total number of prescriptions written for a dangerous drug, total number of persons seen, the state of residence, where are these people coming from, are they local, and a log of all attempts to access and review the PDMP, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit more on that in a moment. We also talked about zoning, we talked about location, we talked about co-location, separation, distances, and the like. At this point in time, the recommendations describe an I-4, and that's not the corridor, that's the industrial zone in Orange County. Um, also, we have talked about uh, separation distances. We don't want the PMCs co-locating with a pharmacy on the same property and vice versa, but we recognize that sometimes these developments go on for a long time. For example, a major Walgreens might take years to develop a site, and a, a PMC might crop up in a strip plaza across the street. So we did discuss that actual scenario and agreed that a variance would be good. We also would recommend a thousand foot, like you all, a thousand foot of any pre-existing pharmacy, school, daycare, or home, daycare center, or daycare home. Um, some separation distances, but with the variance allowed to be requested. Regulation of pharmacies. This was something we delved into later on after the law pretty much prohibited all the doctors from dispensing drugs, and that shifted over to the pharmacies to dispense. As Carol mentioned, we noted in the committee, subcommittee, a spike in pharmacy applications across the state and in our area. And so we started looking a little more at pharmacies. Plus we had Walgreens, CVS at the table, we had independent pharmacies, we had a lot of input, a lot of ability to talk about how we could do this. 
Um, one thing we talked about was um, using the Maitland model identification requirement. Prior to filling or dispensing any prescription for a dangerous drug, there would have to be identification, government-issued identification presented. And we did agree that when there's verification of insurance or health plan coverage, that that would be, um, could suffice for the required uh, government-issued identification. Verification of prescription. After much debate, we agreed that if the pharmacists were in doubt as to the validity of the prescription, then that, that pharmacist or his or her agent would, would want to contact the doctor to verify the prescription. We talked about pads being stolen and, and whatnot, and we agreed that was a, a reasonable method to control that issue. Records. Pharmacy would keep a record of all prescriptions filled for um, two years. Pharmacist compensation. There was some discussion and, and allegation of, of bonuses offered for the filling of, of specific drugs, and so it was added that it would be unlawful to pay any bonus for a specific uh, dangerous drug, so it's those opiate analgesics. And again, we talked about the separation distances and the ability of the applicant to request a variance from that 1,000-foot separation distance requirement. This is a big one. You all, um, Kimberly included this in her recommendations to you, and um, this is something we debated, discussed intensely in the subcommittees. It was a requirement of a prescribing physician or agent to check the PDMP. Um, the subcommittee ultimately recommended within 24 hours prior to prescribing a dangerous drug, the prescribing physician would access and review the patient's information on the PDMP. We also talked about the pharmacist or his or her agent checking the PDMP prior to dispensing dangerous drugs. Again, if there's insurance involved, we know that they are tracking prescriptions that are given to the patient. So this is limited to those who, um, where verification of insurance or health care coverage has not been done. As um, Carol mentioned, they did adjourn on October 31st. We'll bring the recommendations back soon. They voted to recommend the board adopt all enforcement subcommittee and health care pharmacy subcommittee recommendations. Additionally, the task force voted to have the board extend the current pain management clinic moratorium for 180 days in order to give the board time to review the recommendations. Um, the current PMC moratorium it will expire December 14th of this year, so we have set a public hearing for December 6, 2011, to recommend the board extend the moratorium until June 12th of next year. Um, like you, we would have zoning. We have zoning recommendations. They'd have to go through the local planning entity, and that does take some time. We should be bringing our report back to the board around early January. Commissioner, <coughs> excuse me, Commissioner Lynham and then Commissioner Stewart. What's your question? Who's your question for? Carol? Um, well I think so. Out. But you know when you wait too long, you, you know that question, question you asked me earlier. <laughs> where were you in 1968? I'm like, hey, I don't know where I was. <laughs> but uh, I did send the mayor an uh, email uh, saying that he probably was in kindergarten or something in 68. But um, I did write it down there. So I did write it. I think it was Carol. Um, and I wanted to focus in on the prenatally substance exposed mm -hmm. babies. And um, many people, um, and I think this would really get to the heart of families when they know the impact of this. And a lot of folks don't even know that prenatally substance exposed babies can be severely damaged even by marijuana. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> they, don't absolutely. See, they think it's just crack and cocaine, but mm -hmm. it's marijuana and of course these drugs um, really uh, cause severe abnormalities and brain damage and of course the main one is detachment and never get into a lot of those milestones. I believe the generation of little thugs, we're looking at uh, many of them, are those babies who were prenatally exposed in the 80s and we have this generation of kids without a consciousness mm -hmm. because, and, and you have to literally go to a hospital I work with families who often uh, release these babies for adoption because they have they, they just can't even attach many of them or require such severe I mean serious care it's it's so different than raising any child ever and uh, since the 80s we have been studying this phenomena 
And I would like for us, as we move this campaign forward, to not gloss over that piece, because when families know the damage that they're creating internally to these babies, um, not only from just crack cocaine, but all of these drugs, maybe that will, um, will help us. And I just, that's just got to me on that, because one mm -hmm. of the things we've done through the years was to work with um, prenatal exposed babies. And we had, maybe call them, um, uh, what do we call those little homes for, for foster care? Because I was a foster care supervisor and an administrator uh, for those people who were special and mm -hmm. taking care of and snugging these little babies and caring for them. The other thing I noticed uh, under the other lady, was that you talking about the prenatal ease? That was, that was me. Um, Commissioner, it is something that I, I wanted to let you know. The Attorney General has a focus on this, and she's been going around. Again, Florida is, or Orlando is number three in the state. Pinellas has been uh, severely affected by this, by the number of drug-exposed babies, especially those that are opiate-addicted, and I believe Miami-Dade. We're kind of the top three counties that um, she's putting a lot of efforts towards this, a lot of education. It's a very sad situation. I think the Sentinel did a, a big expose piece on this because, as you mentioned, um, mothers who have who've taken legitimate pain medication, mm -hmm. then got addicted to it, realized they're pregnant, wanted to get off of that medication, and that's not the course that their doctors recommend because you can't have a, a, a significant withdrawal for that, right. for that the, the fetus. So they have encouraged them and have kept them on uh, methadone, actually. So they're on methadone throughout the stages of um, until the baby's born, and then it's a it's severe process just getting them, weaning them off of that, so they're giving the baby as they're born methadone again. It's it's a good six to 12 weeks, and I'm sure if you talk to an RN that's working in there, they can just see all of the issues that that young mother and that baby's experiencing being addicted to opiates right, you know, right at the beginning of their life. So it's, it's devastating. It is something we need more awareness on. I, I just think so, because as a social worker, I work with those babies, placing them out of the hospital, but the part I thought families, people mm -hmm. just don't know about it, they exactly. don't relate it. And I was thinking that someone ought to literally draw the parallel or the connectivity between those youngsters and cheap, those little guys who are chasing out there on those bicycles and whatever else they're driving and walking around with. Um, there is some connectivity mm -hmm. with their emotional disconnect mm -hmm. and this uh, 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 sociopathic behavior and psychotic behavior. It's just uh, the real lifeline. Um, while in Phoenix, also, I saw something, and it was at a CVS. <laughs> um, I went to a CVS, <laughs> and when I walked in, the, um, the lady, the, the, what do you call the people who the, take care of people, take your money? Cashier. Cashier. Whoever she was, she was, there was a man purchasing something. I didn't see it, but I know what it was. I mean, it was an alcoholic beverage. And she was telling this man, in Phoenix, you can go to CVS and you get beer, wine, and liquor. And I went for something. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they would not sell this man, whatever he was trying to buy, uh, alcohol, whatever the alcoholic beverage was. She said, I will be responsible. This store will be liable if something happens and I smell the alcohol on your breath, refuse to sell that product, uh, we've got to get doctors to not necessarily smell something, but to see, and you know and I know when mm -hmm. someone is high on something and you still prescribe, uh, there's a problem. Also, just recently I was in the hospital and I told them I was allergic to fentanyl. They didn't know what fentanyl was. <laughs> I couldn't find anyone, they couldn't spell it. Um, and that is an opiate. I mean, it's a painkiller. And so <laughs> maybe it wasn't the doctor, but it was everybody in the doctor's office and the hospital. I won't tell you which hospital. But they just didn't know what it was, just had no idea. So I felt real good. At least they don't prescribe it, I don't think, <laughs> yeah, that's, because that's they didn't know what it was. Also, on the distance, that 1,000 mm -hmm. feet that we were talking about, I would really like to see that as the crow flies, because you can go a thousand feet going around the corner mm -hmm. and still be in somebody's backyard, right. but a thousand feet just walking around the block. And we've done that uh, in planning before. So I think Linda was here. Um, it was somewhere over in, um, when we were doing, um, uh, I don't know, OBT, North OBT. Something was happening, and um, the thousand of 
feet or 500 feet at that time, separation really was not as a profile. So that thing was very close that the neighbors did not want. Right. And we were literally going around the block, and you can go three blocks and almost get your 1,000 feet, and that thing is in your backyard. So I, one of my recommendations, Linda, is that we look at as the crow flies from whatever that location to whatever the residence or the church or the residence is. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. All right, Commissioner Stewart. Carol, thank you. I've been digesting a great deal with the comments you had. One comment that kind of strikes me, and I, and I guess I probably don't quite understand it, since you worked with the task force so closely mm -hmm. on the countywide. Um, the state's cut back from 41 million pills to roughly over 900,000 pills. Exactly. But the demand or the impact on our community continues to go up. So my first thought is kind of looking at the math. Where are those 40 million pills going? And then the second is what what is do we have any real understanding of uh, of the direct impact on our citizens in Orange County and the city of Orlando? Very good question. Um, as Ms. Laskoff mentioned, 41.3 million was what we saw in the first half of 2010, and even a more staggering statistic was 611 million pills purchased by practitioners and pharmacists, so including both operations for 2010 that were dispensed in Florida, purchased and dispensed in Florida, 611 million. So all of us in Florida, all 18 million people could take several of those. Uh, we have plenty to go around. But you did see a dramatic effect when the state law came into, into effect. And I think one of the pieces is uh, July 1st, the law went into effect. July 3rd, the Surgeon General issued a quarantine on all prescriptions that these uh, Schedule 2, 3s, and 4s, that if you're a pain management clinic, a physician, you're going to be turning those over either to law enforcement, which will quarantine those drugs, or you're going to be giving those back to your wholesaler. So out went their, uh, their supply that was coming to our citizens. They still can prescribe. And you still have some pharmacists that are here for all the wrong reasons. You have pain management clinics that got out of that business that said, and we're already seeing that trend in South Florida, where they're opening up independent pharmacies. And there's a lot of good ones, and we spoke to a lot of great ones on our task force, but there's ones that are popping up that I've even seen in my area that you know, it's, there's a Walgreens, there's a CVS, there's a Target, there's a lot of places to go for medications, and here's another uh, independent pharmacist going up. So I think where you're going to see the distribution still occur is on the pharmacist side. And when you look at just what the state's already predicting with the number of new applications, mm -hmm. and those aren't your retail chains, those are independent pharmacists coming into the state of Florida. Uh, until June or July 2012, the state law has legislation for pharmacists and those are your community pharmacists independent pharmacists but that doesn't go into effect till July 2012 so there's time here if you're into unscrupulous behaviors you want to make a lot of money that might be the profession you're getting into now and you're still able to dispense and it's again a cash a cash for product that's not a recommendation is it <laughs> <laughs> that was just a little bit of finding a fact for what okay. we discovered. So, no, no, sorry, that's not a recommendation. It's just something to look out for. And I think we tried to address that with some of the regulations. And, and even our, you know, the Walgreens and the, and the large retail chains um, have seen this. They've seen this happen. So they said, you know, checking the prescription drug monitoring program, it's not required under state law. It is something that they said they didn't have an issue, especially when you're looking at someone coming in cash. You're not coming in with your United Healthcare or whatever healthcare. You're coming in with cash or your Visa card to fill these three or four scripts, which could be a dangerous, um, you know, toxic mix. Um, so they didn't have a problem in uh, making that re making that recommendation go forward, checking that. Um, so we'll see again what the the board recommends. So, um, so Commissioner, it's 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 a question that I think once we see more. At, see more data collected, and I know it's very new. The prescription drug monitoring program, is, as Ms. Lascaus mentioned, went into effect September 1st. They did ask um, anyone who dispensed medication to go all the way back to December 2010. So they did a large data dump of all scripts that you fill that are scheduled two, threes, and fours into the system. So we have a lot of records, a lot of data that our physicians began looking at that on October 17th. So physicians can sign up. It's all voluntary at this point, but they can sign up and then have access to it's called a patient advisory report. So they can look at that before um, they see that patient or before they prescribe any medication. Let me make sure I repeat back to what you just said. Yeah. 
there are 611 million pills like this in pharmacies throughout Orlando. I mean, that, that's well, that Florida. Was a, that was a 2010 statistic that DEA provided. It was okay. in a, a news article that I'll be more than glad to forward yeah. to you all, because I, I was shocked by that. We knew the 41.3 million. We said that a lot for those first six months. But when you added the pharmacists in of what was purchased by practitioners and pharmacists for the state of Florida, 611 million oxycodone pills. Is there a shelf life on those? Well, the, I think the, the shelf life came very quickly for those that had them July 3rd in the state that weren't supposed to be dispensing them. So either they've got them out in the community or they were quarantined or given back to the wholesaler. Now, that doesn't pertain to the pharmacist because they're allowed, obviously, to dispense that, and then they have to enter that information in the PDMP. But for pain management clinic physicians that might have bought up a lot of stock of that, that was, the, um, that was part of the new law. By July 3rd, they had to just get rid of those medications. I, I'm, again, let me make sure I understand. So therefore, if, if effectively 41 million are being passed out mm -hmm. in a year to people who go through pain clinics that we think the large number of them, if not all, are taking advantage of, of just getting access to drugs. That, are you telling me that in the state of Florida, the demand is over 600 million pills just in terms of normal well, if you And I'm just going on... What was purchased. Yeah. So okay. if you look at what was purchased, 611 million for the entire year shows why every other state in the union was looking at Florida yeah. to address this, and that's that's what really House Bill 7095 did. Uh, 35 states, I mentioned this, I think, back in January, have a prescription drug monitoring program. We were one of about seven or eight states that did not have one. We enacted a legislation, but it wasn't operational. So I think. Everything is moving, obviously, in the, in the right direction. Um, but that is some staggering, staggering numbers when that's I looked at that. I, was, I had to look a couple of times to make sure I was reading that right. Uh, that was what was purchased. I can't say what was dispensed, but that was what was purchased uh, for 2010 by pharmacists and, um, and physicians throughout the state of Florida. So. Incredible. Thank you. I got a quick question for Dana. If I don't, did I lose her? And probably Dana and you and Kim together. The first question I really have is, in terms of your ordinance, mm -hmm. uh, help us with the time frame of the approval of the ordinance. I know sure. you've got 180 yes. days moratorium to kind of go through this. Because we're going to accelerate, I think, our ordinance mm -hmm. so that it's going to be in January. And I know that we had the, the process of working the, on the secondary metals right. between the yes. two of us was... Your process is very different than ours. Yeah. So help us with the process of sure. the ordinance approval. Sure. This is um, – Carol and I will bring the task force report to the board in early January, and at that point in time they'll direct us how they wish to proceed. Um, with regard to the zoning portion, like you all, we also have to take it to our local planning agency, our planning and zoning board. And that is um, generally the way our planning and zoning board takes up an item is you take it to them as a work session item and discuss and overview the item and then bring it back to them the following month for the public hearing. So we always allow two months for the planning and zoning commission in Orange County. Following the planning and zoning commission's approval and finding of conf um, conformity with our comprehensive plan, at that point we would set it for a public hearing with our Board of County Commissioners. Um, it's a land use, it's a zoning change, so it'll be an after five. We'll have the two public hearings like you all do. That takes another couple of months. We um, anticipate working very hard <laughs> over the next several months in order to meet that June 12th uh, moratorium deadline, but it would probably come in in late spring, I would imagine. So your ultimate goal is to actually have that 180 days to give you time to complete the draft and accomplish that task? Yes. Yes, sir. The 180 days was specifically selected by the task force in order to give us okay. the time to get the item through our, our system. Understanding your bosses, which is hard to do, do you anticipate having them be extended any further? I guess I'm going to have a leading question. The question is the consistency between your ordinance and the consistency <coughs> between our ordinance. But we, one of the things we tried very hard on the secondary metals is to make sure we didn't create an environment where people were coming into the city right. or going into the county. Right, right, right. Yes, and, and um, we, we're bringing the item. We'll bring the education recommendations as, a, as an item and then the ordinance, which includes PDMP requirement. You check the PDMP um, on each patient. 
It also includes the zoning that we talked about, which includes the separation distances. It includes those operational and substantive requirements, which are the reporting requirements. Um, we have no way of knowing what the board will approve to, to take on now if they'll choose to wait and see how 7095 actually takes effect, if they'll want to wait. What I have seen trend-wise is a lot of moratoriums are expiring, and as they expire, those locals are taking up zoning. And I do believe zoning is probably our strongest feature of the recommendations, I would, I would estimate, given the trends we've seen in other cities and counties. Um, re regarding the PDMP check, regarding some of the other operational, I, I, I really can't say. I yeah. wouldn't begin zoning to seems to me to be the long-term solution, and the short-term solution is reporting. And, and also, if you bear in mind that the legislature's taking, um, they're going back in session in January. The industry has mentioned they're going to be pushing for legislation, preemption. Um, zoning is the one thing 99.9% .9 of the time a local government keeps. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we see very little preemption in our right to zone, and that's a home rule issue for us. And so, um, I mean, all the way home rule zoning, sometimes they, they allow the family daycare homes in neighborhoods and whatnot. They, you can't zone that out. But for the most part, you see zoning being the one thing you can, you can always hang on to. So zoning is our, I think, probably locally speaking, is our strongest um, is our strongest tool in the toolbox right now, given this time of transition. I guess, and Kim, in the light of that, is that is February extension enough? Should we move it to April or May, and and to allow us to have some of these come in different ordinances to us, one in zoning and one in terms of enforcement? I'll let Kyle address that one because we had discussions in regard to. Good morning. Kyle Shepard, Assistant City Attorney. As far as the timing goes, you know the existing moratorium here in the City of Orlando expires on January 1st, this, this coming January 1st. And um, right now, the schedule, um, our schedule shows that the Planning Board is going to consider the zoning and land use elements of our proposed ordinance in December. Okay? So this very soonest that we could come back to you all and get final guidance on on the ordinance would be when the MPB minutes come to you sometime in January. So we're, we are looking at needing to um, extend the moratorium. Um, probably 60 days or so is going to be is going to be plenty if we could get an extension through January and February. Then we can bring back whatever ordinance the uh, planning board and and you all ask us to uh, to go back and uh, go back and draft. So what would have to happen is is in the meetings in December uh, we'll bring back an ordinance that is amending a proposed ordinance to uh, extend that moratorium by 60 days or so. It, that, that proposal may also have a modification to the definition of pain management clinics. As you know, we have a definition in the existing uh, moratorium ordinance. And what we've seen is, is that Orange County and other counties have come up with probably a better definition that doesn't capture the legitimate uh, doctors that are out there that are sometimes captured in this definition, which is really trying to get at pill mills as opposed to just pain man all pain management clinics. And so we may also propose a slightly new definition of pain management clinics so that we're capturing only the bad actors and letting the um, uh, legitimate doctors uh, through the net. I guess what I'm th my concern is uh, do we anticipate having to come back and bring our ordinance back again for modification next summer? pending the same similar definition for pain management clinics from Orange County? Uh, well, no. We've, we've taken a look at the draft ordinance that Orange County has, and um, it, it happens to be largely the same sort of stuff that we were thinking about as well. There's going to be differences because we have differences in zoning terminology and land use terminology and some other things. There, there may be other differences. Uh, we need a little more time to go through and, uh, and check to ensure that, particularly on the operational side, that there's not federal or state preemption somewhere. The other thing that you might have happen is us come back after the next session, and as you just heard Dana mention, there is a push to preempt local government regulation in some of this area because it is so heavily regulated at the state, at the state level. And um, so what often happens, as you heard Dana say, is that we often get left with our zoning and land use powers intact but may have some preemption on the operational side. Uh, and, and, and you often get that in a, in, a, in a case like this where you have such heavy state and federal regulation that there is a fear by the legislature that if you had the heavy state regulation, the heavy federal regulation, and then you had 67 counties and 400 cities doing their own thing, that it could be confusing to legitimate physicians who are out um, uh, not doing the wrong thing. Thank you very much. Commissioner Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Quick question, reference. I was just looking at the uh, draft for the Orange County Ordinance. And the section uh, about penalty, and I keep talking about this because I'm concerned about what, how we're going to go ahead and, and manage this. It says that um, it's going to be it's going to be punished. A violation of the ordinance will be punishable, according to section one through nine of the Orange County Code. What these entitles? It's comparable to um, your section one eight. The second degree misdemeanor is the maximum the state allows us to use as a punishment on a local ordinance violation, unless you go, of course, the code enforcement route, which has the heavy monetary penalties. Um, so our 1-9 is comparable to your 1-8, which is the second degree misdemeanor equivalent, and also includes the injunctive relief. My concern is when we catch some of these guys, when law enforcement officers catch one of these guys with uh, drugs, illegal drugs, Schedule 1 through 5 is automatically a felony, yet these people are being held at a lower uh, standard. So. I wonder what we can do to enhance this. You know, it's not fair for the little guy to be paying for uh, with a greater amount of punishment when the big guy is getting away with murder. Well, keep in mind, Commissioner, that there's two levels of regulation here. They, they're breaking a state law. Um, as you say, there may be um, penalty penalties. Um, but local governments, counties, and, and, and cities alike are restricted on the kind of penalties that they can mm -hmm. Uh, employ on somebody that violates a, a city or county ordinance. Um, our um, section of our code is section 1.08, lays out the different ways that we can enforce. And the equivalent, the criminal equivalent, is a second degree misdemeanor, but of course we also have the code enforcement route as well. I understand. Maybe there's a way of us taking this to Tallahassee and maybe changing the uh, state law. I can comment that comes up frequently in Tallahassee. The League of Cities and the Association yes. of Counties try to get the local penalties enhanced to be more comparable. Those, what, they're about 30 years old now in law. Those penalties have been there forever. Thank you much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Diamond. Um, one last question, I think. I think, I were, Carol, I don't know if it was you or Kyle, but you said we were going to look at the definition of pain management clinics and I think your point was that was um, possibly too broad a definition. And earlier today we had a, um, a map that showed where pain management clinics are in the city. So I'm wondering if you change the definition, how that would change that map. We'll find out. When, when, um, uh, when, if we do propose to you a new definition along the lines of what, what the county has proposed, um, we'll look and see who that impacts. Uh, because you're right, right now, the net, based on the uh, definition that you have now, captures all those folks. But if you change it, it may not capture all of them. And so we'll have to look and see who it affects and who it doesn't. But we'll report that to you if we do, in fact, propose a change in the definition. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. And I think also, um, I know um, on some other things, when you've talked about distance separations, we've seen maps that would show if there was a, a separation requirement of 500 feet or 1,000 feet or 2,500 feet, here's, here's where things would look like on the map. I think that would be an interesting thing to see as well. Okay, right. Just like we did with adult entertainment. Yeah. You know, when, we, when we did those maps that showed you precisely where those places could go based on the regulations. We'll do that. Yes. Thank you. Kim, Carol, and Dana, thank you for the presentation. And from the county side of things, thank you for coming over. and. Another good example of intergovernmental coordination and cooperation. So, Kim, I know as we move our ordinance forward, we'll continue to collaborate with the county to make sure that we stay as close to parallel as we can. And there's general consensus, I think, from the discussion that we're on the right path and schedule-wise as well. So thank you all. Thank you. That will conclude our workshop for the day.